Well, good morning and welcome to the worship of our God and our Savior. A special welcome to those who are online as well. We are limited in number here, and yet we praise God for the technology to reach out online, and we pray for this service to be a blessing uh, for, for you as well. Let's uh, have a pre-service song. We'll sing number 153, 153, O Day of Rest and Gladness, and we'll sing the four stanzas of this song. before this great God in, in prayer and prepare our hearts with prayer. Let's pray. Almighty Father in heaven, we praise you that you, the great God who reigns over all, have called us to come and that you bring peace, peace to those who are far off and to those who are near, that you provide comfort for those who mourn and that you provide rest for those who are weary that you are the God who offers himself to us, that we might taste and see that you are gracious and trust in you. And so we ask that in this uh, day of worship and this day of rest and gladness, we would rest in the peace which Christ has won for us, that the peace of Christ would rule our hearts, and that we have been called into one body and that we have been called to peace. May that be on our hearts as well. And so we pray that you, the God of hope, would fill us with all joy and peace in believing that we may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, please rise for the call to worship which comes to us from Psalm 136. The psalmist cries out, O give thanks to the Lord. 
for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. O give thanks to the God of gods, for his mercy endures forever. O give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, for his mercy endures forever. The psalmist concludes, who remembered us in our lowly state, for his mercy endures forever, and rescued us from our enemies, for his mercy endures forever, who gives food to all flesh, for his mercy endures forever. I'll give thanks to the God of heaven, for his mercy endures forever. We confess that our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Receive his greeting. Grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. And all God's people say, Amen. Well, let's continue our worship by singing number 118B. Stanza 1, 2, and 4. 118B, the glorious gates of righteousness were thrown open for the Lord Jesus Christ, and we celebrate his victory. Turn to Colossians chapter 3 as we remember the risen and resurrected Savior who ascended into heaven. We think of that this afternoon, the ascension of our Lord and how he prepares a banquet uh, for all his uh, fellow victors, his people, to join with him. And we are now called to set our minds on things above where Christ is and not to set our minds on things of the earth. It's, it's very hard and uh, this time, it's very distracting, it's very um, discouraging, and sometimes we can just focus on the things of this life and lose sight of the things of heaven, where Christ is reigning without any opposition, and so let's set our minds on him. Colossians 3, verse 1, and actually, if we could read together at this time, if you have your Bibles in the New King James Version, I'd like to start reading together again as we read the scriptures. Uh, and for those online, please, as well, uh, join with us in reading uh, God's Word together if you can. So, Colossians 3, verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. 
in which you also once walked when you lived in them. But now you must also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you also were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the God the Father through him. Let's come before him in prayer, and as we do, remember how great he is and how we need to humble ourselves before him. Let's, let's pray. Almighty Father in heaven, we confess that <clears throat> you are great, you are glorious, but we have sinned, Father, against heaven and before you. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have failed to honor you, the God who gives us every breath and sustains our every step. Against you and you only have we sinned and done what is evil in your sight. We have not obeyed your voice to walk in your laws which you have plainly set before us, though they are holy and just, righteous and good. Who can give a complete list of his errors here? Cleanse us from secret faults. We have offended you, Father, and we pray that you would cleanse us of all of our sin and that out of the, uh, the hardness of our heart, you would make us humble, that you would make us teachable, that you would help us to yield, that we would love Christ, and that we would seek for the things above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. And so, dear Father in heaven, we thank you that there is forgiveness with you, that you may be feared, and that Christ would be made known as his blood was shed. And so we ask for this to be true in our church here, and we pray for this around the world, that sinners would call upon the name of the Lord and be saved by the grace that comes through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, let's sing as a song of response of the grace of God in Christ, number 433, stanzas 1, 2, 3, and 4 of number 433, Amazing Grace.
The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water. And so we have the Lord Jesus Christ, the Paschal Lamb, the Passover Lamb that is uh, described here for us by John the Baptist, his forerunner. And so the, the witness is clear, the witness of John, the witness later on in John's Gospel of, of the Father, the witness of the Father's works that are performed through him. There are so many witnesses, ultimately the witness of the Spirit being poured out um, as the ascended king gives gifts. Indeed, he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and there's no other to look to uh, other than him. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 12 and read together from God's word. In Exodus 12, we'll read the first 28 verses. And in this chapter, we see so much of the Lord Jesus prefigured and foreshadowed, and the Passover is what our topic is, and yet there's also this other feast that we sometimes forget about, the Feast of Unleavened Bread that is attached to the Passover, extending it then for seven days. So the Passover is not just a one-night thing, it's actually a seven-day celebration as it extends into the Feast of Unleavened Bread, one of the three great pilgrim feasts uh, to Jerusalem. So page 57 in our Pew Bibles, we'll read together the first uh, 28 verses of this uh, institution of the Passover. And then later on in the passage, you see it's the institution of the, of the feast. And so let's read together. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight, and they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in the fire with unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roast it in fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it, with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, so you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. 
On the first day there shall be a holy convocation, and on the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation for you. No manner of work shall be done on them, but that which everyone must eat, that only may be prepared by you. So you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for on this same day I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the first month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the twenty-first day of the month at evening. For seven days no leaven shall be found in your houses, since whoever eats what is leavened, that same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a stranger or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened. In all your habitations you shall eat unleavened bread. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Pick out and take lambs for yourselves, according to your families, and kill the Passover lamb. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses and strike you. And you shall observe this thing as an ordinance for you and your sons forever. I will, it will come to pass when you come to the land which the Lord will give you, just as he promised, that you shall keep this service. And it shall be when your children say to you, What do you mean by this service? That you shall say, It is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and delivered our households. So the people bowed their heads and worshipped. Then the children of Israel went away and did so, just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. And so far the reading of God's holy and infallible word. Let's sing as a song of preparation number 131b, uh, stanzas 1 to 3 of 131b. We sing of their, how our hearts are humble and yielding before the Lord. We're not proud or haughty or lifted up. We're humbled uh, by the word of God and we're seeking to obey it. So 131b stanzas 1 to 3. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Almighty Father in heaven, as we have just sang, we long to trust in you and to know you, and yet we want to humble ourselves and know that you've only given the things that are revealed for us to know. And so help us to seek those things out and to 
be as those Israelites who bowed their heads and worshipped the God who is glorious and whose ways are beyond our understanding. We give you praise for your glory and your power. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, dear brothers and sisters, loved of the Lord Jesus Christ, what are some of your favorite memories in your lives? Things that really stick with you. The events that you just, as you think about them, you'll never forget. Um, these are interesting things to think about, right? The things in our lives that will never be forgotten are usually the things that are, are tied to our senses. And God has given us a plethora of senses, right? The sight and the sound and the taste and the, and the smell. And um, he, he, as we have these different sensory receptors taking hold of an event, it means more to us. Uh, God has also given us other ways to remember things. It's through severe emotional trauma we remember things, usually that we don't want to remember. It's through severe joy as you're going on a roller coaster and you remember the, the nature of the feeling uh, from that roller coaster, the, the severe joy or the, the great joy that you have at different times in your lives. God uses our emotions to make things memorable. He uses our senses, our emotions. God does many things to help us to remember um, things, but one of the, the things he also does is he uses the calendar. He, he makes dates on the calendar that, that are, are dates that we can't forget, dates that we must always remember, as we'll see. God's wisdom in the Passover feast is before us, and what the Lord did here is he he understands the weakness of the human mind to forget most of what we go through. Most of life is, is forgotten, right? But some things are remembered. And God would have the Passover and the, the lamb, the Paschal lamb that was slaughtered and sacrificed be remembered. And he knows that we tend to forget things. And so what he did was he changed the calendar, as you see in the first couple verses of Exodus 12, what was not the first month became the first month. So their religious calendar was shifted as per the date of this uh, sacrifice of the Passover lamb. God commands that this Passover feast be celebrated throughout their generations, continuing in the ages to, uh, to come until the, the Lord Jesus fulfills that. This is, this is a celebration that must be carried on. And so, this is the love of God for Israel and helping them and their fragile minds, which are prone to forget uh, what's important. God helps them through the change of the calendar, through the shifting of, of the date, so that now this is the first month of the year. Nisan um, is, is the time when this is happening. And the people would be marking this day year by year by year, with even pilgrim feasts, going to Jerusalem and gathering with the saints in the city as they awaited for the Paschal lambs to be sacrificed uh, by the priests. Let's consider the Passover this morning uh, of the people, God's Passover, the Lord's Passover of his people. And our first point to think of is how this is, was a sign to Israel. And how the second point, a little change, it was a statute or an ordinance for Israel, and then thirdly, the sign to the Lord. So first, the sign to Israel is before us, and this is the sign of the Passover. Egypt as a nation was under judgment. It was shuddering, the last shudders of death. Uh, it's a vivid picture, but this is, Israel, this is Egypt. Egypt is ruined as a result of Pharaoh and his hardness of heart. Do you not see uh, the, the Pharaoh's Servants said to him, do you not see that our land is ruined? Uh, this land was devastated by God and the plagues that he unleashed upon them. And remember why he did this, that he might show that he is the Lord, in verse 12 of chapter 12, that he might execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt. And remember how all these various gods of, of the river and of the land and of the sky were being we're being uh, highlighted here as powerless, especially Ra, their sun god, the incarnation of which is Pharaoh. 
He's powerless. There's nothing to him. And yet, in the last six plagues, the last six of the nine, Israel has not been affected. Israel has not been under them. They've seen it, they've heard about it, but they haven't actually been experiencing the heat of the plague in Goshen. There was a distinction that was made. But now in the tenth plague, what you have is Israel itself now being put under the knife as well. They will die if they do not take hold of God's remedy. The eldest child of every household will die. The eldest animal on the farm or the one that opened the womb will die. And so this is a day of great danger for not only Egypt, but also for Israel, as God will come against any who are not covered in the blood. And Israel is as guilty as Egypt of sin. All, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is none in Israel who can say, I am righteous, I have not sinned. They too have sinned. Now, Israel was tempted throughout her history to think that she was better than the nations around her. Um, the Pharisees in particular, the evidence of this in Jesus' time, they thought they were so good. Their external rites and, and um, rituals made them feel like they were really clean. Um, and and it, it makes sense that Israel would think this way again in the last six plagues. God had not touched them. They were special. But the Egyptians were the, the evil ones, and they were touched by the plagues. And so that you can imagine the, the Jewish identity starting to form, that we are special. They are not. God loves us. God doesn't love them. And therefore, we, are on a different, we have a different standing with God than they do. But remember, the standing that we have before God is never because of anything in us. It's never because of anything that I've done. It's not because of my father or my grandfather or my great-grandfather. The Israelites often thought they were special because of their, their forefathers, right? They, to them, they had the fathers. They had Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. They had Moses as their leader. And they, the Jews found great um, confidence and, and courage in their heritage. But even that is insufficient because all of them have sinned. In fact, Joshua really puts a knife through that um, thinking when he says in Joshua 24 uh, that Abraham himself was born of a family of idolaters. And so even Abraham was not, um, his heritage, there was nothing for him to look forward, to look back on, right? They were all idolaters. And so Israel could not depend upon her heritage or her father's for righteousness. There is nothing that Israel could depend on for righteousness. And yet, I press the point on us that today, it's, it's a tendency for us as well to think that we can depend upon our history, our tradition, our, our, um, our righteousness that we see in our own lives. We can depend upon this to imagine that God thinks of us differently than those around us. But that is simply not true. Israel was idolatrous just like Egypt was idolatrous, and we today are the same as Israel was. Remember how Israel, after being delivered, after the Red Sea, before Mount Sinai, which had been smoking like a fire pot to heaven, remember how even there, before the mountain, they are worshiping a golden calf. They're worshiping uh, an image that Aaron helped them set up. This nation was just like Egypt. They were no different. They were stiff-necked. They didn't change. They didn't yield much. They were hard-hearted, and they also needed to be saved. And so the horror of the tenth plague would not, would not, uh, would not be just against Egypt. It would also be against Israel. The precious blood of the people had to be shed unless the precious blood of a spotless lamb was shed as a substitute or an unblemished lamb. There's really only one spotless lamb, and that's Jesus, as Peter will say. But for now, what it says is there's an unblemished lamb. And this lamb couldn't have any broken bones. This lamb had to be a perfect little lamb. It's the favorite little lamb. Uh, we're having little birds in our home. Our budgies are having babies. 
And it's always fun to see what kind of babies are born, what kind of kitties are born. You don't know exactly what you're going to see until you see them. But there's all, usually one or two that you really like, that's really special. And so children, imagine this little lamb. This is the special one. This is the most beautiful one of the bunch. This is the one that God says must have its blood be shed. Without the shedding of blood, there will be no way that the angel of destruction will uh, bypass your home. The only way the angel will, will pass over or leap over your home is if there is blood on the doorposts and on the lintel. And so salvation is being prophesied here. It's being projected into the future. What it means to be saved, it's not by your righteousness. It's not by your heritage and your history. It's only by blood that covers you, that covers the entrance to your home. That's the only way that salvation will come to God's people. The Lamb's precious blood that covers the household is a picture of the precious Son of God, the Lord Jesus. He is the one who can take away sins. The blood of an animal never could, Hebrews 10 verse 4 says. It, it, it never could. But it always looked forward in anticipation to the one who could, and that is Jesus. Peter declared it in 1 Peter 1, verse 19, when he said that Jesus is that lamb without blemish and without spot. He's, he's perfect. He's spotless. He's, there's no broken bones in his body. He is beautiful. He's the one perfect lamb. And that speaks not, obviously, just of sight, because Jesus his visage was marred more than any man. It speaks of what's inside. It speaks of his, of his righteousness, of his goodness. There is nothing suspect, nothing awful, nothing evil in him at all. He was perfect and pure. Perhaps Peter was thinking about John, what we read in John chapter 1, verse 29, when John declared, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John was very likely thinking of the Paschal Lamb. That was sacrificed when he looked at Jesus and said, this is the one that will save his people from their sins. Perhaps that's also what uh, Paul was thinking when he wrote uh, in 2 Corinthians 5, or 1 Corinthians uh, 5, verse 7, of Christ as our Passover lamb. This was on his mind as well. This is who Jesus is. You know, throughout the Bible, you have this imagery of an animal that is slaughtered to save the people in some way or in many ways. Even in the garden, you see that the, an animal had to be killed, that Adam and Eve would be clothed. Right? That's the one aspect of the, the sacrifice. That, that Now, out of this comes clothing. Out of this comes a righteousness. And so it is in the garden scene. But at the end as well, in the last day, there is a picture of the lamb that is slain. And, and it, is the, it is now the object of our praise. Right? Not only is, is the, the, the lamb being sacrificed the object of sorrow, it is also the object of, of great praise and glory, as you see in Revelation 5. This is, this is the reason why we are motivated to worship, because of the lamb that was slain for our sin. All throughout the Bible is this imagery of the lamb or, or the animal being slaughtered, that God's people might be saved and given righteousness. You know, my children love animals. And, um, and I do too, but my children especially, they, they've taken it and they've run with it. And Although the boys like shooting them too. But there is still a love for animals that I see in my children. And, um, and I remember uh, one day when we had these little moles running around in the backyard and I killed the moles. It was a devastating day for my son. He, he, he wept as he saw Daddy killing these, these little mice, these little blind critters. And, and when, our, when one of our budgies was, was, um, was feeding on a mouse trap that we had in, in the cage for some reason to kill the mice, uh, you remember, it was, it was our prettiest bird. And, and this pretty bird, was, we found we woke up in the morning and he was dead. And his neck was, was in the, in the mouse trap. This was a horrible day. My kids do not forget about these horrible days, even though they happened years ago. They remember the, the beautiful bird in the mousetrap, and they remember Daddy killing the, the moles. You know, dear people, imagine how hard it would have been to see your father, to see 
the priest kill this beautiful lamb every year. Every year, another lamb. Another perfect lamb. This was little Eddie. I loved Eddie. But Eddie is now dead, right? This is something that would be graphically burned and etched in the mind of the children. They would not forget it. God was making this memorable. He was helping our fragile, feeble, forgetful minds to remember the horror of sin that needs blood to be shed. The blood of something special, someone that was far better than, than we were. It wasn't understandable. It didn't make sense, right? Imagine if, if I today killed a lamb and I started splattering the blood on my door, on my, on my threshold, not on the threshold, not on the bottom, but on the sides, on the doorposts and on the lintel on top. Imagine what the neighbors would think. They wouldn't understand at all what I was doing. And so Egypt as well, they look at this and they, they look at what's happening and they think this is crazy. These Hebrews have gone crazy. Isn't that what Paul says about preaching Christ? This is foolishness, utter foolishness to the world. Christ, the God of glory, coming down and laying his life down? That's utter madness and folly. And it's a stumbling block even to the, to the, to the, uh, to the Greeks. But Israel was called to teach these truths to her children and to graphically portray them even year by year. Verses 25 to 27 say this, It shall come to pass when you come to the land which the Lord will give you, just as he promised, that you shall keep this service. And it shall be when your children say to you, What do you mean by this service? Daddy, what are you doing? Right? You shall say, It is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and delivered our households. And so this was a teaching moment for the children. God would have his children follow him and know him and know the horror of sin. And sometimes we don't know the horror of our sin enough, do we? And we think my, my own righteousness can atone for my sin when it cannot. There's nothing I can do to make myself pure. You know, children that are listening, imagine, imagine being one of those children in Jesus' day. And you've been, you've been watching little lambs, beautiful little lambs be slaughtered year after year. But now you're, you, you're, you're going to Jerusalem and you're gathering with the pilgrims in Jerusalem because this is a pilgrim feast, as we'll hear in our second point. And so now you're, you're heading into the city. And as you head into the city with, with this little lamb in tow, you, you come... Uh, to this road that heads to, to Jerusalem. And imagine, you're, you're one of the ones that now sees a man riding on a donkey. The Lord Jesus is riding there on a donkey in front of you. And, and these little lambs are before him, and these little lambs are after him. Because the amazing thing about when Jesus entered the city is that he entered on the 10th day of Nisan, which was the day when all these lambs would be entering into the city. And so it's very likely that there were lambs in and around before and after him coming into the city. And so here you have Jesus entering into the city and, and you're casting your coat down before him and you're, you're cutting down branches before him because you've heard that he's special. You, you've heard something about him and you're looking forward to him and you love him. And yet, four days later, on the day of the Passover, when these little lambs are, are slaughtered on the 14th day, Jesus himself is slaughtered. And Jesus himself is put upon the cross. And the whole sky turns black for three hours. There's darkness that covers the land. Imagine what it would have been like to be one of the children in that day that, that saw the lambs with Jesus and that saw the darkness when Jesus himself was crucified, this would have been a day that they never would have forgotten. This would have been a day indelibly etched upon their hearts and their minds. And that's what the Lord intends for us to think of when we think of his son dying upon the cross. This is something that's unforgettable. This is shocking. How could such a one, so pure, so holy, so righteous, so good, be sacrificed, had his blood poured out for us. It doesn't make any sense. 
The only way we can make sense of it is by faith in the plan and the purpose of God who, who said that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Leviticus 17, verse 11. Without the pouring out of the Lamb's blood, we would be dead in trespasses and sins. And so the Passover is the first thing that we, we see here in the passage. But the second thing that we see is this ordinance or statute of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Verse 8 introduces it. In verse 8, you have, Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in the fire, with unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. And then in verses 14 to 20, it describes in detail uh, what this uh, memorial, this ordinance, this lasting ordinance that lasts for seven days would look like. So again, in terms of making things memorable, um, this is like a holiday now. God is setting a week aside for you to remember what he's done. So God is, is etching this on the hearts of his people. This is important, children. This is a vacation time. This is going to Jerusalem to rest and celebrate with the people of God. This is unforgettable times. And God makes it last for a week. This Feast of Unleavened Bread is... It begins with the Passover, but it doesn't end with the Passover. The Passover is what starts it all off. But then after the Passover uh, meal, there is this seven days of remembrance. Seven days of not eating anything with leaven. And remember how it said twice, if you do eat something with leaven, you would actually be cut off from Israel to the point where the, the strict Jews today will sweep their homes of any leaven that's in them. They will... They will Make a big show of it, of pushing out all the leaven from their homes. What's, what's, what's all this leaven about? Why would they do this? Well, leaven indicates sin. It's an indicator of sin. A little tiny bit of sin makes the whole lump, it affects the whole lump, right? A little bit of sin in my life, it affects everything. And there's, there's, there's simply none allowed, no sin allowed for those who are in the people of God. If you're part of the covenant people of God, you may not sin. But of course, we are all those who should be cut off because there is sin in all of us, but that's not allowed. And that's what the feast is, is, is showing. There is no sin allowed in the people of God. And that's why it's tied to the Passover lamb, because the lamb takes away all the sin of the people of God. But, but the two are matched. They're connected, they, and they must be. Otherwise, there's no hope for anyone to be part of the covenant community at all. It's eaten with bitter herbs. Why would you have bitter herbs? I wouldn't want to eat bread. I, have, I made bread that was a little bit bitter before for my children, and they didn't like it. So why would God make us have bread that is bitter? But it's to remind us of the horror of sin and the horror of slavery in Egypt. This was not good. Later on, the, Egypt, the Israelites would look back on Egypt and say, oh, for the days that we could drink, uh, eat onions by the Nile and, and leeks and onions by the Nile, those were good days. But they weren't good days. These were bitter days, bitter, hard, hard days that they should have seen if they looked, if they remembered, you know, what Moses wrote earlier in Exodus, Exodus 1 and 2. These were horrible days of slaughtering children, genocide days. And the bitterness of the herbs reminds them of the bitterness of sin and the horror of slavery to sin. And so through every aspect of the week-long feast, all week long, you're eating these bitter herbs, these bitter breads. This is not something you forget about, is it, children? This is not something you think of um, as being a good thing. And yet, it is a good thing because it's reminding you of what's important in life. You see how God is using the senses to teach the people what's important about their heart. God is very good at making things memorable, isn't he? There's another reason why it was unleavened, and that was because they had to rush. There was only a, a couple hours before they had to leave. And, and as they, as if they would have let the leaven work, it's wonder, and just, isn't it amazing to watch leaven work? You know, it's, it's such a neat thing to see how bread rises. Um, it, has a, it has a great power. But, but if they didn't have time for that. They had to exit quickly because 
you see how it says here, they had to have their staffs and they had to have their sandals and they had to, they had to be ready. They had to have their belts tightened. Verse 11, this was a day when they had to get ready to go. I was thinking about this in light of uh, trips that I made um, to the airport and you're always watching for the taxi to come and you're doing the last minute things, you know, waiting for him and usually you're, you're chewing on a bagel quickly or something. You're, you're ready. He's He's, because he's coming. He's coming soon. And you want to be out there as soon as you can be. Well, so it is for Israel. They're, they're, they're on the way out. They're exiting this nation of slavery. And so they have to be ready. And that means unleavened bread. At least in the first instance of this feast, uh, that was what was necessary. But what is behind, or, or what would make you not leaven your bread then? Not only this, this understanding of sin as leaven, but this understanding that I need to believe in the Word of God. And that's what the sacraments always call us to, isn't it? They always call us to faith. They call us to believe the Word of God. The promise of God was we will exit Egypt tonight or by the morning. And so this is the reason why they had unleavened bread. To, to, their, their exit is happening very soon. And so they don't have any leaven in their bread. It was a lasting statute or ordinance. It was to be celebrated yearly, annually, and it was to be a pilgrim feast where they all traveled to the city of Jerusalem. So what a memorable thing this was for the people. And uh, one more aspect of the feast to bring out. There's so much to do, I can't do it all, but they had to eat together. This was a together feast. It wasn't just alone. So next week we were hoping to do Lord's Supper in the afternoon. Um, but we won't be doing that. We can't do it together. We can do it with 10 of us, but that's not really what we want to do. And so th there's, a, there's a togetherness aspect to the Lord's Supper that must be maintained. And we can't just do this on our own. It's not just about me and Jesus. It's about the household of faith, the, this, this, this growing body of living people together, eating and drinking this meal. Well... That's the statute and the ordinance. Then thirdly, we see how this is a sign not only for them, but for the Lord. In verse 23, we see this. And the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. So the lamb's precious blood wasn't just for us to remember and teach our children about the horror of sin and the need for remission, forgiveness. The Lamb's blood was a statement to the Lord. It was, a, it was the evidence to the Lord that this household is safe and secure, covered by the blood. And it was not just for the people, it was for the Lord. That is something powerful about sacraments. The sacrament, you know, do this in remembrance of me, is not just for me. It's not just for you. It's that the Lord would remember, right? And as often as you do this, you proclaim the Lord's death until he come. That means that when we do this celebration, we're proclaiming it. Where? Even to heaven itself, with the spirits of just men made perfect, we're declaring to the assembly of the elect, the firstborn in heaven, we're declaring what Christ has done for us. This is a reminder not only to us, but to them, to our God in heaven, the judge of all. We are righteous. We are forgiven, not because of what I've done, but all my leaven is removed because of the blood that was shed for me when the Lamb poured out his blood for me. You know, sometimes we make the Lord's Supper about ourselves. And we say, I, I feel like I'm ready to go to the Lord's Supper this time because I feel good about my faith. I, I remember doing that, and that's just not helpful, right? That's not what the Lord's Supper is about. It's not a statement of your righteousness. It's a statement of his righteousness and his glory and his forgiveness for you. And so remember, this is what you see in the Passover. It is a statement to them, but it's also a statement to the Lord. The Lord will see the blood and pass over the household. It's a reminder then, too, that it's not just you and the Lord. It's, it's those who are gathering with you, those who are living with you, this household. God saves households. He loves the whole family, even the little bitty babies. The Lord loves them all and covers them all. 
While there was so much weeping and wailing, again, get back to the memory theme. There's so much about this night that would be totally unforgettable. Imagine you're, 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 you're eating this, this barbecued lamb. Does that not taste good? I can't imagine. It must be so good, right, to taste all this barbecued lamb. You have this unleavened bread. That's not good. It's bitter. But then you have these bitter, wailing cries that you hear in the distance. And this, this is what makes it memorable, right? When you hear the emotions of those around you, and you see the emotions, and you, it amplifies, it etches it in your brain. The, the cries, and we didn't read it, but of the, of the Egyptians, as you read through the rest of the chapter, the, they were devastated by what happened that night. And so here you see the power of the sacrament as well. There's devastation to those who are not covered in the blood. But to those who are covered in the blood, what is there? You see it in verse 27. They're bowing their heads and they're worshiping. You can imagine all these households all over Goshen. And these people are bowing their heads and they're worshiping. And outside, there is this weeping and wailing and this gnashing of the teeth. This is a picture of the final judgment. This is a picture of the final joy as we bow our hearts and our heads before the glorious Lord of lords and the King of kings. And we are gathered in to his feasting table as we'll hear this afternoon. But for those who are outside, for those who are not allowed into the feast because they're not covered by the blood, it's not the same. There is weeping and there is wailing. A great cry, it says in verse 30, in all of Egypt. And so there's so much about this feast that is memorable. There's so much about this feast that we need to think about when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. It's not the only line in the Old Testament to the Lord's Supper, but it is one of them. It's a very important one. And it's a line that helps us to remember the damage of disbelief, the damage of hardening your heart in unbelief where Herod went. It leads to death. But the joy of living in submission to Christ and living under the blood covering, it leads to great, lasting, eternal joys. Pleasures forever at my right hand. We're going to sing a new song after this sermon. And listen to what it's, it tells about, right? It's, it speaks of the beauty of the Lamb. Um, this is what we need to remember. This is what you need to remember in the coming weeks. The, the, the beauty, the glory, the blood of the Lamb. Where the blood is poured, death's dark angel sheathes its sword. At the Lamb's high feast, we sing praise with our, or to our victorious King, who has washed us in the tide flowing from his pierced side. Praise uh, we Him whose love divine gives His sacred blood for wine, gives His body for the feast, Christ the victim, Christ the priest. Let's come before Him in prayer. Almighty God in heaven, we praise You that You have provided a Lamb's blood, the perfect, spotless, unblemished Lamb's blood as a covering for all of our sin, and that my righteousness is nothing, and I don't need it. It's not the way I'm saved, but that the righteousness of Christ is, is ours through faith in Him. And so may we all know the blood covering that comes through faith in Christ. And we pray this for each of our, our dear people, that they would know what it is to be covered by the blood of the Lamb. And we ask that we would be a people who remember, who remember the beauty of our Savior and the blood that was shed for a complete remission of all of our sin. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's uh, turn in song and sing number 196, stanza 1 to 3 of 196, and maybe we can play it through once uh, so we know how it goes. <laughs>
that song is worth the whole change of that hymnal. I just love that song. We might be singing that a lot more in the coming weeks or months. Well, as we come to the Lord in prayer, we want to remember our sister Maria. She has a, a niece, Nelia, and Nelia has surgery on Thursday. It's a, a very important surgery, a, a cancer in her womb. And so I guess it's a hysterectomy and, and all that goes with that. So it's a very, but it's spread, the cancer spread. So her uh, and Nelia and her husband Frank are, are in great need of prayer. And uh, hopefully our sister can visit with them and encourage them today too. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Almighty Father in heaven, we praise you that you are the Lord of life and the God who has such a plan, such a beautiful plan of salvation. We marvel at your wisdom. We marvel at the way of making it so memorable. Uh, there's, how could we forget what you've done? How could we lose sight of the importance and the weightiness and the gravity of believing in the Lord Jesus Christ? And yet, Father, we confess we have forgotten you. We have forgotten the sacrifice that was made and the blood that was uh, given, that was shed. We have forgotten to remember the bitter nature of sin and the, the bitter nature of darkness and the darkness that was poured out in fury upon Christ on the cross. And uh, these things start, do not always come alive in our minds. And we ask, dear Father, that you would help us to remember and believe and that we would have the opportunity to gather together, together again and proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would come again soon, that you would make all things new, that you would cause there to be revival in our land and reformation, and that we would, as a nation, turn to you before you return. Uh, for if you come now, how many would die in their sins and trespasses? And so we ask for our leaders to be given grace to follow you, love for Christ, love for the lamb that was slain. We pray for this for our prime minister, for our premier, for our mayor, for all those in authority over us. Please, may they kiss the sun lest you be angry and they perish in the way. We ask for wisdom for our leaders in, in light of COVID. Help them to have um, much um, thoughtful care for your people and for the, the world at large. It, it is a confusing, terribly confusing time for our leaders too. And we ask for grace and for strength for them, in particular for Premier Ford, as he's under a lot of stress these days. Please encourage him and give him uh, much wisdom as well. And we pray for our healthcare workers. Uh, many of them also apparently feel like quitting and, and it's not easy and, and bearing the emotional load and trauma of seeing people suffer and perhaps die is not easy, uh, especially when it's in isolation. And so we ask that you would be gracious to our healthcare workers as well. And Father, we pray that through this time of testing, our nation would realize what is important and that they would see that they must humble themselves and seek your face and live. The plagues were such a picture of the God of judgment and the God who comes in wrath. And we pray that our nation would would turn from sin and turn in the path of righteousness and follow you. Father, we pray for the churches to be bright beacons of light in the darkness, that we would, as Christians, go out into the world with your gospel. And even though it's a foolish message that we proclaim, may we do it boldly. And may we declare with gladness what Christ has done in shedding his blood for our souls. We ask that you give us fruit in this ministry. We long to see more fruit, more young men and women serving Christ. And so we pray, dear Father, please make our words to be seeds that produce a harvest. And may the gospel just seep out of us. May it be so clear to those around us that we are blood-bought saints of Christ and that we're not like the rest of people in this world. Father, we ask that you would help us to have a great love for the lost. So often we can look at those around us who are hurting and who are in pain and, and tie it to their own sin and say it's a result of their own problems and their own sin. Um, 
And yet, Father, we would be in the same place were it not for your withholding grace. And so help us to have mercy toward those who are in misery and help us to have hearts that are full of grace and compassion and that long to give gifts to those who are hurting. We think of Maria's niece and the great need that she has, that Nelia has uh, to be healed of her cancer. And we pray for wisdom for the doctors as they operate on her. On Thursday, we ask for the surgery to go well. And we pray that you be with Nelia and her husband, Frank, and encourage them through this time. May their faith and, and love for Christ be real. May that be what carries them through. We pray for Maria to have an opportunity to, um, to comfort them in the gospel. We ask, O oh Lord, that you'd be gracious to the sick and suffering of our church. We think of the Westricks and how it's just a long-term throbbing pain that they suffer, and yet we pray for grace and for help for them and for strength. We pray this for the Bolchus as they too now suffer another form of cancer uh, in, on the, the skin and, the, and his head and the continuing problem of the lungs. We think of our brother Henry Amzinga and, and the struggles that he has with the openings in his in his stomach, and we um, think of the bakers and the struggles that they have, and continuing with cancer as well. And we think also of our, our sister Bevan Hall and, and the continuing burdens of the fibromyalgia and TMJ and and the many issues with her back and her pain that just continue to um, make life difficult for her as well, and for those who suffer from diseases of the mind and, and the struggles that come from not remembering our loved ones. Uh, Father, the pain that we have in, in, in every home is real, and yet we also know that the pain that we have is, is limited in, in its time. Uh, you are a God who will wipe away every tear from our eyes as we hear this afternoon. You are a God who has a plan to make us um, a people who will never suffer anymore. And what a, what a beautiful plan you have, and we praise you for that. And so we give you glory, O Lord Jesus, for your resurrection and ascension and session. You are the seated king who is all glorious, and we confess that we trust you, and we want to know how to trust you more, and so help us as we worship you to learn how to trust you. And uh, as the, the saints of the past in, in Moses' day, bowed their heads and worshipped. May we also learn to bow our heads and worship and yield to the wisdom of the King of Kings. And so fill our hearts with love and adoration for you on this day of gladness and rest, we ask. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we give of our gifts, of our tithes and offerings to the work of the local church and the budget. And let's sing at this time, let's stand and sing number 473, By the Sea of Crystal, number 473. <laughs>
receive the parting blessing of your God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And all God's people say, Amen.